What is up, everybody? Welcome to my show. With me is a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Cat Jam himself, Landon Tice. Uh, it's so random because I've been asking you to come on my show for so long, and you're just super busy crushing uh, the world of poker. How are you? I'm, I'm chilling. I'm big chilling. You're big you, chilling. You're big chilling. I'm big chilling also. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's take a look at your Cat Jam shirt. Yeah, this is shirt bought by Veronica. Look at it, buddy. All I, glory. I bought Bam. him that shirt. This is the greatest shirt. This is the greatest shirt I own, probably. Uh, I bought him that shirt. I saw it in like some random Vegas uh, like store. Vegas, like uh, it had all like the Vegas little thrifty things you could buy. Souvenir and, shop, uh, if you will, huh? The what? Souvenir shop. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was yeah, you figure you got it. So, what is up? What's up, Big Chillin? How are you doing? You uh, had this massive win at, uh, was it at Venetian? Venetian, yeah, MSPT had a tournament at the Venetian. And uh, you won it. You're crushing yeah. everything online. Trying. It's been. Uh, yeah. I, w I want to hear about like who you are. I feel like you stream poker. You're always talking about poker. I want to hear about who Landon is. Let's talk about Landon. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know much I have to offer besides poker, to be honest. <laughs> You're a really interesting person. Mm -hmm. uh, you on and I kind of became friends Veronica. a little while ago. huh? Yeah. I'm an interesting person on interesting people with Veronica Burrell. <laughs> <laughs> In order to qualify, you have to be an interesting person to some extent. I mean, I think you have to be an interesting person. I think we both became friends because we're interesting people, right? Interesting people. Yeah, that's a fair statement. Interesting yeah. people doing, doing, just doing our tasks. <laughs> so, yeah, so if we're going to talk about that, you have an Among Us. Well, you have a server on Discord that I you do. invited me to. And it's all you and all these like poker crushers, these online crushers. And we all play Among Us together. We do. Um, your name is Isalova, baby. Isalova. That's my ACR username, yeah. Solid. Yeah. Uh, what, like, what got you started in uh, playing Among Us? And um, I put it off for so long, and then like, I just started watching YouTube videos, and I was like, yeah, like, this game looks kind of fun. But like, it's only fun like, if you're playing with friends, right? Like, if you just play with random people, it seems like not as great. But like, you play with the same people every day for like, a couple weeks. Like, it gets fun, you know? Like, you, you just, it's, the, it's, the, it's the daily Among Us grind, you know? You're in there for a couple hours, <laughs> get after it. You slice a little bit. You do some slicing, some grinding. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't fake your tasks. We don't, don't like tasks. that. <laughs> so, so it's you're full. Of, the The server's full of all these crushers. One of them is Jeremiah, and I just heard you guys talking about uh, which one of you has a higher score on World Series of Poker. Which yeah, he, he's got me right now a little. I bit. feel like I'm trolling you right now. I mean, got into poker couple years ago at least seriously i think i left school in like 2019 started in like january 2019 when i left florida state and then before that triplet so i got two brothers i have a younger sister and sort of played games all my life played chess when i was younger played golf football basketball you name it just kind of in the mix and my brothers and i are highly competitive and you met them you met, you I met, did. I met your entire family. You have an yeah. awesome family. So it was a surprise. It was just like, hey, want to hang out? Oh, by the way, my entire family is going to join us. <laughs> yeah, my family's here. Yeah, it was great. But uh, yeah. yeah, so you met them and we're pretty competitive and they kind of helped me like, I guess, have a competitive drive because like I didn't want to be like, obviously, when you're like eight, right? Like the most big topic of discussion to everyone in school is like, who is the best at what? And when I was in like lower school, it was always, it'd always be like before I switched schools and went to a different school than them. It was always like, oh, like who does this better? Who does that better? And like every single time, all three of us said the same answer, and it wasn't anyone else but ourselves. It was always me, you know, from everyone. And yeah, just from there, I just really wanted to take games seriously. And I was in chess. When I was younger and did pretty well in that. And I started to just play games all the time. And Poker sort of seemed to be something that I really enjoyed doing that I kind of chose to be a, a game I wanted to do because chess was the game I played when my parents wanted me to play. And then I switched to golf, which my dad wanted me to play. And then all of these other games, which I've had a lot of fun in because they're very interesting, 
but then like poker was the first game where I was like, oh, like I'm gonna make this decision to uh to kind of see what I can do with this thing. How did you find poker? What was the first what was the first thing that brought you to poker? So my dad kind of taught us when we were younger, just kind of out of nowhere to be honest. So like I knew of the game, and then in summer camp sometimes like we'd play like poker tournaments for like snacks and drinks and stuff, just like all the kids that were in the in like the dorm when we were like 12 or 13 like we'd like the buy-in was just like this like our snacks and it'd be like okay like first got x amount of snacks so it's like it was like there's a tournament and then like three-handed there'd always be like a deal for snacks where it's like i'll take the oreos you can take the grilled fish and we'll call it a deal <laughs> it was great and from there i just sort of like saw how fun poker was and then i sort of not lost interest but didn't really research and do it like kind of look I looked at it more until I until I went to college and I had a friend that I met playing basketball every day in the gym and he he was just like hey uh $20 buy-in tournament if you know how to play poker it's at my friend's house stop by and I was like oh yeah sure sounds like a lot of fun and I ended up ended up winning that to be honest which so I'm I'm here when did you start realizing that you could make a living off of it Probably that night when I realized, like, it seemed like a game where it's, like, if you think in a certain way or, like, not think in other ways, like, you can do pretty good for yourself. And I've always, like, kind of, like, attached to my sort of, her like, identity in some ways, like, being somewhat like, relatively, like, intelligent and things of that nature. And it just kind of seemed like a good fit to kind of play a game, which I did my entire life, and then move to so, poker. So you said it's a game that you could think in some ways and not other ways. So, and you're alluding to intelligent thinking. So tell me, can you break that down for me? What is it about the thinking within poker that attracted you? I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of people in poker for sure that sort of have their conclusions and they sort of just stick with their strategy and whatnot. And I sort of just realized like, I'm sure there's, there's gotta be some strategy stuff for poker. And I, when I started looking at like YouTube videos and stuff and like, how to actually, I guess, improve in poker in some ways. Like I saw that people were using like solves and I wasn't necessarily even concerned about them at all, but I was just like, oh, like it seems like there's something that you can use to check, like double check your work, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then sort of like skirt away from like a bias of thinking that you have to play in a certain way just in order to, because it's right, so to speak. And then from just drawing my own conclusions, playing a lot, having a lot of friends that helped me and having a lot of people that were really good at poker kind of helped me out in some ways. Granted, I was like grinding for like 12 hours in my room every day, like an unhealthy amount for like 18 months. But there was a lot of trial and error at the start of just seeing what worked, seeing what didn't, and sort of trying to figure things out for myself as well as not really have an ego about it. But it's really difficult when like you first start getting into something and you think, you know what the fuck's going on. And then things don't go your way and you think it's like it, things that are outside your control. So and, it, is that what you mean by the ego, not having an ego about it that like you have to kind of chill out with the things that are out of your control? Like, how do you manage that? Um, it's more like with ego in the sense of like thinking that like, your line of thinking is always the greatest line of thinking. And like, maybe there are other people with stronger opinions and reasons for why they do things that they do that are just more logically sound and have more, more thought to them, so to speak. Cause that's kind of how we, as people work, like myself included, like I'm sure every time I play a hand, like I think I play it as best as I can until, unless it's like a pretty difficult spot, but like every, every, so often, like every other hand I play, like there's always something I can do better. There's always something that I can choose, like a different bet size or a different action. And it just sort of helps, helps me like kind of keep myself in check and realize like, yeah, like I guess I'm pretty solid and had some pretty good results and playing some pretty high stakes. But at the end of the day, like I'm just trying to be the best version of myself in this game and trying to improve every day and focus on those sort of things rather than the amount of dollars that I can specifically make, which is pretty counterintuitive to the entire poker landscape with most people talking about like how they want to like see poker as sort of a transitional thing where they want to move out of poker and do something else and I don't really have that feeling yet and I really enjoy kind of seeing how good I can get so 
I've noticed in you uh, what it, one aspect of you that I think it, you need to have at a young age uh, to be successful, and I think in anything, and that is I see a lot of obsession in this from you. And it, obsession doesn't need to be a negative term. I can see that it has completely taken, uh, taken you in a way that you're so passionate about it and um, when you say, when you say you don't care about money, and you've said that many times, you've tweeted about it, yeah. it is basically like this pinpoint focus where even this obstacle of potentially what you, that a lot of poker players face when they're at a downswing or they're losing money and or their fo their focus is on the money, you don't have that obstacle. So talk to me about like when this obsession started and what your life entails with poker. Like what is your day to day within poker? When did this all start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I first started playing poker a lot when I was in college and I st after that tournament and just sort of saw cash games as like a good way to spend my time when I wasn't in the gym playing basketball every day. And when I sort of found poker, I just, fell in love with the idea of the game and wanted to get better and always wanted to improve and I guess try to run up a score because I didn't have a job in college and I didn't have I haven't had like a quote-unquote real job like ever in my life so I just saw poker as like a potential way to like make some money at the start, at the start of like okay like this can help pay for things while I'm still in school in the sense of like food like utility like not even like mm -hmm. not even like a salary of like making like tens of thousands of dollars but I was like oh like if I can make a couple hundred bucks a month like I can eat some vending machine snacks and like not really worry about it kind of thing because like like most college kids like basically like broke kind of idea and from there I just sort of kept with it and like just wanted to improve and kind of see what the game was all about and it was also sort of helping me not have to get a job even if you're playing like micro stakes and you're playing two cent four cent and you're winning like a decent like 30 40 dollars a day as like a college kid it's like okay like what else could i want kind of thing and then from there i just sort of <clears throat> had a pretty big obsession of trying to keep moving up in stakes and i guess i saw it as my version and the way other people see it too as like leveling up of like oh i was playing two cent four cent and now i want to play five cent ten cent and then ten cent twenty cent and then kind of go that way through and sort of see what happens and just by the fault like the higher stakes you play like you just need to have more dollars to do that and the only way in poker besides like adding more money and like having a job or having a replenishable role is like to just run it up yourself so when i was first starting playing micro stakes and i had a i had a, a good friend of ours um kind of just helped me with, with poker stuff and from there he just i just sort of saw poker as something i, I could actually do and I started playing 20 and L, like 10 cent, 20 cent. And I probably played that for like eight months. And I was just like playing for 10 hours a day for eight months a day, like having Joey's podcast on the other, on the other monitor and like doing timestamps at the same time. And it was just something that completely like enveloped my entire life because I didn't really want to go to classes. I would be like, oh, like, yeah, like econ at six doesn't really feel too, too good to me. I'm just going to play more poker and watch more podcasts. And from there, like, you can go check now like on Joey's stuff like in the past two years like most of like the highlighted tweets just me doing timestamps of things that yeah. I was gonna watch anyways like it's funny like talking to like Nick and like Nick and Chewy and Matt like when I'm like oh yeah like two years ago like I was doing timestamps for you guys and it was it was something that was like really kind of we all kind of laugh about it and it's like wow like yeah like you're a timestamp kid so to speak like at least back then and it was a uh, I mean I kind of just took over my entire life because I let it in the sense of I didn't really want to do much else besides get better at the game and put in hours. And I knew what it took was just to grind a lot because everyone that went on Joey's podcast all said the same thing about working really hard and just studying and having a friend group that can help you and just talk to some good friends about poker that you think are good and just keep playing and playing online helps you get in more hands and more reps and just get to where it's pretty possible like if you just grind a lot you can a get out of downswings faster because you're playing more hands if you're playing them playing pretty well and b like you just learn more through trial by fire if you keep 
playing more hands versus trying to play online and every single spot's very nuanced because you only get to play like 15 hands a session kind of thing in the sense so, of hands you actually play not not like get cards for before i ask you about how you got mixed in with your current group of people that you're working with i really i just want to know like what is it within poker that drives your obsession i think from like poker because when i was when i first started kind of getting into poker more i was doing some like dgen sports betting stuff and like that didn't really go too well and like as a college kid i lost like 2k betting on like sports and stuff and i remember like having to like weekly like kind of pay that off and stuff because i had my like my brother sort of like helped me like at that time because i didn't really have many many dollars and i just sort of remembered like yeah like if it wasn't for poker like i'd probably be fucked and like i didn't like i, I would probably have to like get a job somewhere and do something like of that nature and i didn't really know what that was because every time i was taking a class i didn't really know where it was going to end up like i was like oh yeah like i don't see myself wearing a suit or like i don't see myself like doing math or i don't like i didn't really like even in college like I never had a major, like I was an exploratory major. I didn't really figure it out. So like poker is something that like helped me figure it out. And from there, I also want to like make poker like a better place and like try to be that, try to be like what I saw in other people, like to others. And it's really fun kind of like seeing that sort of like happen kind of slowly, but like not that slowly. Yeah. Well, yeah, not that so slowly. You've kind of rocket shifted, shipped it. Is that a word? Rocket shifted yourself? <laughs> to the top so so you you're now living in vegas you're living in uh the sulfur y house you're friends with joey you've got all these like big names backing up you you've surrounded yourself with some pretty amazing people yeah and how did you get involved with these people so the first it's funny because it kind of happened by accident because i've i would stream a good bit and then from there i did a stream i just sort of somehow like had a bunch of twitter twitter interactions with dan with dan zach and he and i just kind of talked about some hands on stream and somehow like chewy was just like on twitch on twitch at the time and saw it and just kind of messaged me on twitter and was like oh hey like we're I talking saw about lucky chewy right yeah we're talking about, we're talking about che that chewy and yeah. uh he was like yeah i i saw the stream you did with dan i would be more than happy to kind of i guess jump on a call and kind of talk about some spots and i was like yeah i mean like legend of the game and like you know like of course like say like say the time and i'm there and it was just from there like he and i had a conversation on stream and then had a couple off of it and then we just sort of like ran some sims and talked about poker a lot and sort of talked about even some other things like just like some ethical stuff and like someone sent me a book about ethics i'm not going to say who they were i need to i need to read uh and this and the shirt here but yeah like just from there um i just sort of got lucky in that way but i grinded a lot every single day i was put in hours and i always sort of felt like i was going to get to this point at some point it was just gonna be a lot faster if i had friends that not even helped me but like i just like kind of put in the volume myself like it's very easy to play like two hours a day and be like yeah like i played today i'm done but like back then and even still now but it's a little bit different. Like I always had like a drive to sort of continually put in volume playing poker, like days off to me weren't really a thing just because I just loved what I was doing so much. And I still do. Like I just loved putting in hours and I was like, I don't know what else I do right now. I might as well play poker. And it's something I want to do. Like it doesn't really feel like a chore. So like you... from there, I guess they kind of saw, I guess they kind of saw like in me what they saw in themselves and they were kind of coming up in poker with yeah, like yeah. just putting in mega hours putting in like a constant like study grind just kind of getting after it so to speak and like two plus two is kind of dead in that regard because i know i know like back then like it used to be really big and there was a lot of kids my age sort of finding their way in poker like siever and haxton and they were all kind of posting on there and also just grinding and getting really good but forums and stuff like that are now kind of dead so twitter was like kind of the next place to do that for now and from twitter i just sort of would like tweet, tweet about my progress all the time. Like I remember tweeting like my 500 K sample I had in a graph in like March that kind of people sort of saw. And I guess that was the first thing that kind of blew up for me, but yeah, I mean, just from there and just kind of getting really lucky and doing some streaming and having the right eyes, eyes on it at the right time, just sort of kind of helped me at least in some ways kind of get here.
So I've had a few people ask me besides they besides them asking me if we're dating, which we're not. <laughs> I've had a few. I've had quite a few people ask me like, "Hey, you're friends with Landon? Like, how did he get? You know, how did he get hooked up with Salt for Why and with Nick and with like all these amazing people?" I'm like. You know, there's a bit of vulnerability with Landon. He's like kind of an open book. He's on Twitter. He's sharing things. He's reaching out to people. Uh, like you're, you weren't afraid to put your progress out there. You, you wrote about quitting college and you, it's your pinned tweet right now. And I, I think, it's, I think it's, it is so beneficial to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to say, look, look I'm coming up. I'm still not as great as I want to be can you help me? And there are people that are willing to help out. Would you say that that could be accurate? Because I, I feel like a lot of people are coming up and they don't know how to get help to get better. And they're too afraid to post hands to stream because they don't want to look bad. Right. So for me, I sort of saw poker as like an educative system where when I first started, I, I had a coach. I got lucky enough to have a coach in that regard. And then when, like, when I wanted to move up in stakes, I joined uh, Jeremiah's stable which he had for a short amount of time, which he doesn't do anymore. But from there, like I learned a lot and like I basically paid for that through like profit chops that I would have. And when I would win like, like tens of thousands of dollars playing two five and like one, two, and like I profit chop like 50, 50 or whatever it was. Like I just sort of saw it as like, okay, yeah, like that's nice. Like I'm also getting money and like getting better at my thing at my, at the game I want to play. And like, I'm also just like, paying to learn stuff because otherwise I wouldn't learn this stuff anyways. And it might take 10 years to get as good as I want to be. And I just sort of saw like, saw like getting backed in some ways, just from, from people that I trusted and people that I knew like had my best interests in mind, as well as obviously understanding like the monetary aspect of like just backing in the first place that like, I was just going to put in all the time and all the effort and be someone that like, if I was talking to Jeremiah, like I'd always just send him hands and like, he'd know, like if he gave me a response, like I would play for three more hours and just, try to like implement something that he like he kind of taught me or I learned something like from the group and like I posted a hand and got a response I was like oh that's that makes a lot of sense like let me try that like I would be the first person to play like 200 hour months every month and like yeah. not, and, like not even think about it because I'd be like yeah like why wouldn't I and yeah like definitely like it's just really hard nowadays like I guess finding backing apparently like back in the day it used to be kind of easier what? And strategy is just like harder nowadays too. So like, you don't really know, like if you're really learning anything, if you're implementing correctly and it's hard to do by yourself. Like poker is not a, not something you really do alone. Like you kind of start alone in some ways, but then at the end, like most people in poker, like have a good amount of poker friends. And if you don't have poker friends, I have a discord server that has a bunch of people in there that play poker a lot. And so, I'm in there too with a cooking yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're in there. And that's the thing is like, that's the reason why I created Discord servers. I had so many people message me and be like, yeah, like, I don't have any poker friends. Um, like, do you know, like, how I can find poker friends? And I was like, oh, sure. Like, I guess I'll just make a Discord server. And then if people want to go and join and talk and find people that they, like, send hands with and are active and they talk a lot outside to, like, DMs on Discord or whatever, like, that's great. Like, I'm glad to, like, sort of have a platform to pro provide a community like that. And like, yeah, it is an amazing community. I've met all of these, you know, crushers now because of it. Now I want to go back to something you said, because I think it ties into you not, not caring about money and it's benefited you so much. Like you were talking about being in a stable and like profit sharing. And yeah. I think some people would say, well, I don't want to share my profits. I'm only playing one, two, I'm only playing two, five, but they don't understand the EV that they would get from being a part, a part of a group where they're growing faster than they would if they weren't profit sharing and they weren't sharing information. Because I think there was a part of an exchange of, like you said, you were under in Jeremiah's stable, but you also got feedback for hands. So although you were sharing your profits, you were getting, you were getting EV in other areas. And I think it's important for people to understand that your EV shouldn't be measured in a monetary sense solely. Right. Like, and then after Jeremiah's stable, I joined Poker Detox for a little bit and uh, run by Nick yeah. Howard. And yeah, like from there, like there was a lot of great people in there that I talked hands with all the time. I put in 200 hour, 200 hour months every single month when I was in detox for a few months and just sort of really made the most of it, you know? And like, you just kind of put into these things what you get out, like you get out what you put in, so to speak, where it's like, 
you just put in the grind and you talk to people that also like to grind and also want to move up in stakes and like have that sort of fire and aren't really sort of just content with playing 200 an hour and 500 an hour for like X amount of years, but trying to get to the top and playing 2K and all on ignition, playing higher stakes if they can live and like all that kind of, all those kind of, those stakes and those things that from there, that's sort of how I got better pretty quick is I always wanted to learn from someone who I thought was better than me just because and it didn't matter like what I had to sort of sacrifice for that in the terms of like profit shopping and things of that nature because it was just kind of the, like what was necessary in order to in order to learn as fast as I wanted to because it's not very poker is like a very difficult game and it's definitely not something I could have figured out as fast as I did and even still now like I don't even have it all figured out like I just have it I'm just in a really good place just because I so, sort of just allowed myself to understand what I was giving up and it was a lot less than what I was going to get out of it. So this obsession that you have, I guess I, I don't, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Maybe it's not an obsession to you. Maybe this is just oh, yeah. normal to you. No, well, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you ever feel this fire burning out inside of you? Do you ever, do you right now foresee any of this slowing down anytime soon? I think that the, I'm sort of seeing it differently in the sense of how I want to like optimize my time in some ways, because I don't play like 10 hours a day anymore, unless I'm playing tournaments, which then I'm playing 20 hours a day. Because if you rag at like 8 a.m., if you, if you rag at like 10 a.m. and you're still playing at 4 a.m., you're probably deep in something at a final table or something. So it's probably a good thing. Or you're hella yeah. stuck. <laughs> right. Or you're, you're, really, you're stuck infinite and you just in, continually rag, yeah. Continually rag, but. That's not me, you know, I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll be on enough to you or something. But yeah, like from there, I just sort of, I just see poker as like how, as like a lifestyle shift of like, okay, like how do I get better at poker? And it's not just playing and it's not just studying and it's kind of trying to like eat right, like have like some like fitness kind of stuff. Like I'm trying to like eat better and sort of live like a more active life lifestyle since sort of moving to Vegas and over the summer sort of. And I just sort of see poker as something that's all encompassing. And it's not just something that like I do for a specific period of time. It's more of like a, like a 24 hour thing where it's like, even if I'm not playing poker and like I'm taking a break, like that's good for poker, for my poker as well. Because if I just grind for 24 hours a day, that's, I'm going to get burned out for sure. Like right. I, it's unsustainable. So like just sort of taking the approach that's sustainable of playing when I want to play and taking breaks when I want to, and just understanding that I put in enough time and effort that I'm allowed to take a break, you know, like it's, it's so like, it's like not that difficult to really explain, but it's difficult to really internalize where it's like, yeah, like I play a lot. I should take breaks and I don't need to struggle to put in volume. It's different if I played like once a week or so, but I'm playing almost every day. And if I'm not playing, I'm studying and that's how I want it to be. And I'm not really in a position to change that at all. Do you feel like you have a good uh, work-life balance, I guess, if poker, you would consider your work? I think so. And because for my work-life balance, like my friends in my work are also my best friends and sort of family in life, you know? So it's like, what's interesting for me to talk about as well as them is just talk about poker stuff, talk about some life stuff sometimes, sure. But like Nick and Andrew and, and many others, they all still have the fire to be better at poker. And it's not just about being successful as they are, they want to be the best versions of themselves. And that's something that I align with wholeheartedly. So it's just really nice to kind of have a very small community where we're all sort of rooting for each other. Like I was at a final table yesterday, Nick was at a final table of the 1K6 max. And it was nice, like, like we're just typing in like the Discord chat, like every time something good happened, like, oh, like, let's, like, let's go. Like, it's nice to kind of have that community. And I didn't really have that growing up. Like, I didn't really yeah. have... Much friend. We, we all actually like we all we all watch you when you're playing we all get together in the discord group like yesterday i was streaming your channel and yep. we're all just rooting for you um so it's yeah you have this like community backing you up yeah it's i mean i'm really thankful for it i'm really glad to have that and like to have it and i'm pretty sure a lot it sort of stemmed from just being vulnerable and sort of progressing and like tracking my journey so to speak and and having it be public. Like I remember talking about going on my first like $2,000 downswing in the sense of like 
two thousand what two thousand dollars is and it's difficult like it's just really difficult to sort of open up like that because a lot of the times you can sort of see it as shining a negative light on yourself but to me it was always a positive to me it was always here's where i am in this spot i kind of want to talk about it and then if someone has some advice in some capacity like i'd love to hear it and that's sort of how i've sort of seen it the entire time but yeah it's 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 an it's really great to sort of have like a community and have people that want my best interest in mind is and it's the same thing i want for poker at, at the end of the day is i want poker to be be a great thing and to continue to survive so to speak and i'm just trying yeah to- i i agree i think the poker economy the live economy has been hit a little hard um th- with covid and everything i have a question for you um what's your biggest downswing that you've had my biggest downswing started over the summer for sure and then sort of right before winning the tournament so when I started playing over the summer and I came out here to Vegas, I was playing in some high stakes live cash game stuff. And I think I went on like an 80 K downswing or so. And keep in mind before I, before, like a month ago, I was playing 500 zoom on in my room. I was streaming 500 zoom. And then I came out to Vegas and was playing some higher stakes live stuff and playing these higher stakes tournaments, like for the WSOP series and stuff. And just out of nowhere, I got the green light to shot take some some high stakes live games like 2040, 2040, 80, 2040, 80. Sometimes it was like 160, which is just insane. And I didn't have the greatest start. And I there was a vlog of me talking about it with on, with Joey on Joey's channel, which you should probably check it out. It's actually a pretty good vlog. It's it's great. I'll I'll and, link to it here because I love yeah. Joey too. So yeah, and so I had an 80k downswing there, and then I started winning some tournaments online, and I won. 1k six max I, I got second in 100k for like 20k and i sort of grinded out of being in 80k in makeup in like a month and a half just from playing tournaments playing every day really trying to get after it not even trying to like win and get first more of just put in volume and kind of see what happened and i got well, really so thoughts I just, the reason why I ask is because I think that one of the biggest struggles that up and coming poker players deal with is just downswings and it can mentally tax you. And I'm curious what type of things you did to be able to, because I think there's, there's digging yourself out of the hole in a monetary sense, but there's also digging yourself out of the hole mentally. And like, what kinds of, what kinds of tools did you use or what did you do to get yourself out of that mental like you can really fuck with you when you're downswinging and then continually you could continue to downswing. And, um, and I think yeah. mentally you need to have the capacity to be able to keep going. Yeah. So tools wise, I didn't really have much tools, but I had really good friends like Nick and Andrew were kind of just telling me the entire time. They were just saying, you don't have to, you don't have to force anything. You don't have to try to win it all back all at once. It's actually how it gets worse. Yeah. We just trust in you and we know that you played well and you did things you're supposed to be doing and just sort of hope in some ways, like hope that you do the things you can't control. And at the end of the day, it's all going to work out. And that's kind of the mentality I've always, like I've had since lose, having losing days or like decent sized downswings. Cause like I say 80 K like it's nothing, but like that's a lot, it's a lot of dollars to just, lose in a short amount of time or just lose at any time like did you review some of the key spots where you where you lost some big pots well yeah so like i lost some big pots in some pretty pretty cooler spots in live i lost like a 40k pot with an over pair versus like a pair plus gutter in a spot it didn't really make much sense but it's just stuff that variance didn't really help my case but it was probably one of the greatest like one of the best things that could have happened to me in the sense of my own like mental improvement and understanding like what matters is the macro, the micro is irrelevant. Like me going on the 80K downswing is that was going to happen. Right. Some percentage of the time, all you, all I can do is do the best I can to make decisions that I think make the most sense in the moment. Right. And, and I, I'm there, like that sort of helped me like kind of grind out of the tournament hole. And I won a bunch of tournaments in a short amount of time while also getting really lucky and running pretty hot. I also just execute in spots that, 
aren't that easy to execute. And it, I guess after getting out of that downswing, I started playing uh, 5,100 online, like 2550 and 5,100 online. And I instantly lost back like 80K or so from like selling action and also just like playing. And then from there, I just sort of knew that my confidence didn't really shake because I knew that it wasn't a lot of big blinds, but it was just a lot of dollars. And I knew every time I look at spots and I review them, I'd be like, yep, this isn't losing any, it's not losing that much EV here, or it's not even, a, it's not a mistake and you played it well and sometimes you just get stacked and that's okay. And then from there, I sort of played this tournament just out of nowhere. I wasn't even, I didn't even know that there was a tournament series in town. And I talked to Matt and he was like, oh yeah, go play this, Matt being Berkey. He's like, oh yeah, go play this, go play this 1100 and see what happens. And I was like, okay, sure, why not? So I ended up bagging on, on day one, like bagging on one bullet. And sort of when it kind of got down to it, I've studied a lot of tournament spots. I've put in some volume playing tournaments. And I know that there's some spots that feel scary because you have to run bluffs like deep in the tournament. If you get called and you get called bluffing in spots, like you have less chips and it's harder to win the tournament and you could get, you could be busted and this, that, and the other, but you also just have to execute in those times because that's what's intended of you to do from playing a strategy well. And I just sort of had that in the back of my mind the entire time of, yeah, this feels kind of scary because I don't have aces here and I'm three betting, but I still have to do it because I know how good it is. And I just got to get it done. And it's not easy, but you just have to implement. So what was the biggest difference you felt in that live tournament compared to you playing cash? Like you just played the World Series of Poker 10K main event online. Right. So the difference is the field in live games, just because of lack of exposure and time is much softer in the tournament scene for sure than online tournaments. And that's just because most people that are pretty solid in tournaments are probably grinding online and not really playing much live. Can, just you, because- can you delineate that softness though? Like what are the uh, like few key takeaways we could say sure. that softness uh, yeah, so defines? People, people under three bet for one, like when you get three bet, they probably just have a good hand most of the time. And they don't really play aggressive post flop. They more try to like have security in the sense of they have a good hand and then like put dollars, like put chips in the pot. So it's pretty easy to like make some pretty big folds or some pretty non-standard give ups on river when they continually call or like they raise you on a street because most of the time they probably just have a good under bluffing those spots. Right. So if the pool is under bluffing, like you're not really, and you're not putting tough spots, you can sort of, play pretty aggressively and then when given feedback in some way then start to sort to kind of figure it out but aggression is always going to be better in those fields versus passivity and that's sort of the approach I took and still take in the way I play poker is I just try to I understand where I'm coming from with with lines I take and I understand like the grand scheme of of why I'm bluffing in the first place is because when I have value hands, I want them to get, to be called. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that have played against me in, in like in that tournament that were like, Oh, like every time I saw him put chips in the middle, he was bluffing. But then when he played against me, he just had a good hand. And sometimes that's what happens. Yeah. So you, you got some EV out of getting caught in some of those bluffs then. Yeah, for sure. Like like, long-term EV. Yeah. Not, like not in a vacuum, but but more long-term yeah yeah like having like i guess having that sort of image of like yeah this guy's capable of bluffing off his entire stack is it's 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 like a double-edged sword because sometimes people call you when you are but then there's other times when you have value and they just and and then they also call you and i guess the idea and the skill edge is understanding when's a good time to kind of go for all of it in a live tournament and when's not and that's just sort of something i'm still learning myself and i also got really lucky in a lot of spots and won a bunch of all-ins as well like very, tournament variance is very real. Like mm-hmm. you, can, you can be a very good tournament player and lose ace king versus aces free. Like they just like have you stone dead and there's nothing you can do. And like, you just kind of have to like avoid the minds. It's like, it's like a minefield and you're trying to like avoid the minds and there's way too many of them to try to get through them all. And sometimes you just end up on the other side somehow. And that's kind of how I feel with this tournament, at least in the sense of the, the, the earlier stages, because later like at final table and after I want to flip a final table, and had like a decent amount of chips to play post flop. I was extremely confident. I was pretty much certain I was going to try to, I was going to take this one down just from the sort of confidence I had and like the energy that I sort of had myself and just understanding where I stood in the, in like in the field. 
and understanding that like I I've put in the time and just relying on like my confidence of my study and knowing like I've put in countless hours studying hands I played every every day and most people aren't and it's not about them doing it's not like it's I don't care about what they're doing I care about what I'm doing right. and I, I've been in the lab and I'm confident in the way I see the game and if I'm wrong I I'm very open to still learning about it but like when it was game time so to speak especially then I was very very locked in of plays sort of just didn't really come to me I wasn't really thinking very much I sort of already had my like automatic response and I was just willing to put the chips in the middle when I had to I think um, one thing you just said, uh, you were willing to be wrong, is uh, such a big takeaway. And I think if we're talking about poker being microcosm of life, being wrong has been, it took me longer than you to, I, I think I was a lot older when I started being okay with being wrong. And it is one of the best growth op uh, opportunities you can have in your life is just being like, okay, I'm wrong. Okay, now let's learn from it. Now let's do better. Just having this ego, as you referenced earlier, and just not being, not allowing yourself to be wrong can be very detrimental in life and poker, like can get, can become very stagnant. Yeah, like for me, even now, like I definitely still have an ego in a lot of ways. And I definitely think I know more than I do in some spots and I get proven wrong all the time, but it's more for me as like an opportunity to grow, but just either when I am playing or when I'm in a big spot. I just have all the confidence in the world of myself. And I think that's kind of what you need in some ways in order to, in order to make better decisions and at least be able to sit with them. And when you, when the time is needed, like I'd definitely, I'd rather feel confident and make a wrong decision than not be, not be sure what's actually going on and then try to figure it out midway, like midway hand. Like I'd rather do something I think makes sense and then be proven wrong. Be like, okay, I'm going to learn from this. Yeah then try to freestyle and find a way to not be clear about a certain thing. And so the me, greatest thing for me, like when I do, when I am unclear is I'll just, I'll look at it and I'll see, I'll try to f see what I can come up with. And if I can't figure it out, I have friends that, that definitely can help me figure it, try to figure it out. So let me ask you, it, um, if you're at a table and uh, your opponent you can tell is, is a great player, do you enjoy that challenge? Do you enjoy be playing bad against someone and someone's just like 10x better than you or like leveling you in certain spots do you love that do you want to go home and fucking grind and study after you see something like that or does it piss you off yeah i mean for me at least now like i definitely have been pretty vocal about sort of wanting to battle and play against whoever and play against people i know are better than me and just sort of see what i can learn and see kind of where i stand in that in that environment because at the end of the day, like, I'm not going to grow by playing people I'm better than. I'm going to grow by putting myself in tough spots. I'm going to grow and try to improve by putting myself in decisions for, that are difficult to make, but just kind of build experience in that way. Like, it's, it's easy to kind of be excited about playing people and beating people in, like, a game you know you can beat. And that's definitely a very valuable skill, especially when going through a downswing. Because it's like, okay, like I'm stuck a decent amount of money. I'm going to play in a game where I know I can win. And it's not only good for confidence, but it also just kind of gets you out of the hole and helps you find light at the end of the tunnel. But when I, like it's, like it's go time and after coming off a tournament score, like this is going to probably be like one of the most confident times I've ever, I'm going to be in in poker in the sense of just understanding about like the grind and the skill set that I'm willing to sort of get after. And like if, if things go poorly, I'm in a nothing my life's not going to change and it's the same thing if things go well it's, my life's not going to change like i'm still going to run sims every day i'm still going to put in volume every day i'm still going to talk to my friends about poker i'm not i don't see an, an end goal of making x amount of dollars and then quitting i sort of see poker as something that uh, i want to be involved in for the foreseeable future how long like i'm not sure and like obviously like burnout happens to everyone and I'm sure many great players have been in my spot where they've been playing for a couple of years and think that they're never going to burn out. And then like year six hits and they're like, what does poker even mean? Like kind of thing. But for now, like, I don't really care about what the future looks like. I just care about making the most of the present. So does anyone around you worry that you hit it too big, too fast? Like you're too good, too quickly. You've reached some peak that 
this could potentially go wrong for you in the coming years if you if you if you maybe burn out or if you don't do so well in a couple of years yeah so i think the idea at least the way i see poker is i see poker through the way i want to sort of improve and the results of like getting too big too fast aren't really at the forefront of my mind but it's more of an improvement scale of like how much better am i now than I was earlier this year. Because right. every few months, I always think I'm the best I've ever been. And the more I study and the more I improve and the more I talk about spots and learn more things, I get proven wrong every single time. You know, like poker is way too difficult of a game to have all figured out and I'm never gonna figure it out, but I really enjoy grinding and trying to get a step closer every every time. Right, so, so when, I, when I met you, I mean, I, I'll just be honest. I. I think you're probably a genius. And I, when I met, no, I, and I, I, I fucking adore you, Landon. I, we've become friends. I think this couldn't happen to a better person because you have such a good balance of genius and humility and kindness. And I just find you to be an amazing person. I think, yeah. And I think I disagree. Like I've had conversations with some of my friends about your, your come up and I think someone like you needs to have an open road to go as fast as you want to and to get as good as you want to. I don't think there should be any stagnant part of the process unless it's detrimental to your health or detrimental to, you know, the long-term goal. But I don't, I don't see that. Like, I think it's, I think that people in your life should be pushing you to do better and to reach as much of a peak as you can, which I still think you probably haven't reached. Right. And that's, I don't, I don't know when that's going to be in the sense of like reaching like the best I'm going to be, because the more I put in work and the more I study, the more I sort of see how much I don't know. Yeah. And, but who cares to think about right. the peak, right? Right. And because I don't, like, I don't see myself as having like a goal. Like my goal in poker isn't like, win X amount of tournaments and then quit or make X amount of dollars and then quit. I just sort of see it as right. how do I get better every day and how do I continually enjoy the game I love to play every day? And that's so, at the forefront of my mind versus what the fuck anyone else wants to kind of think about it. At the end of the day, like, it's sort of like, I know I kind of like keep going pretty fast, but no, no, I remember fine. when I first made the decision of, of leaving school and I, I sort of thought about it to myself and I kind of told my mom for sure and my dad and my brothers and friends and whoever I was just like look at the end of the day like I'm living this life like you're not like it's not it's not about you and like I get to like you want what's best for me and like you think you know what's best for me like at the end of the day like I'm gonna have to live with my decisions and I chose to make this decision and I really don't I don't care what you think what your friends think what they like what other family members think like that's fine like I'm gonna figure out my life and I know I'm smart enough to figure it out and if not like I'll be the first person to go to someone that can help me. Like, this, is the, this is the time to do this, though, because econ will always be there. You can always get your degree later if you wanted to. You know what I mean? This is the yeah. best time to just jump headfirst into something like this. Yeah, and it's just sort of the approach I've, I take, I've took ever since I left school is, okay, like, I decided I wanted to leave something that seemed pretty secure for this. How do I make sure that I don't fuck up? And it's not even a fuck up for like anyone else to take it, but it's for my own because I knew that poker was something that I chose for myself for my own reasons. And part of them being, I guess, my own boss in some ways and part of them like challenging myself in, in like intellectually and getting better at a game I want to improve at. But at the end of the day, like I saw poker as something that I chose for myself and I want to see how good I can get. And it doesn't really concern anyone else in the sense of like, otherwise, like it doesn't really matter to me. And that's okay. Because I, I have friends and I have a family that also support me and understand, like, I guess they sort of understand where I'm coming from enough to sort of give me a chance to do something and end up making it kind of happen in some ways. And, and like, I'm still looking forward to, like, what next year has to bring. You know, like, I had a great year this year just in the sense of moving up in stakes and winning some tournaments and having some success really quickly because I started playing MTTs, like, in, when WSOP was online this year. So I started in July. Like, and I remember being in a, in a call and having some tough spots playing like a $10 freeze out on WSOP. And the next day I was playing like the 3K six max. And it was just kind of an insane sort of, okay, like I'm in really 
good spots to to make something good happen. And I ended up getting really lucky and final tabling a WSOP event. I had final table like a 1K turbo and got sixth, which was insane to kind of say a final table to WSOP event, even though it was online. And it's been a great year, but at the end of the day, like I'm still looking ahead to what 2021 has. And then even after that, rather than like look back and be like, oh, like this was a great year. Like I'm just going to stick with it, you know? Yeah. So, so who's better than you right now? Who do you want to get better than? So in heads up, um, Doug for sure. And many other people that play out like in rest of world sites, like stars, like I'm very confident. Like I still have a lot to learn and I've only put in a very small amount of time in poker as, as a whole. Like, it, I guess it feels like to some people I've been here for a while in the sense of the presence I have, but I've only been playing for two years. And I know that there's people that have worked really hard that are playing stakes on stars that, I guess, have the ability to, to put in more reps and use study more sims longer than I have and know some spots crisper and have better bet sizes than I do. And I'm okay with that, but I'm not really concerned about figuring that stuff out yet. I'm more concerned about how do, how do I keep getting better? And that's just by challenging myself and playing against people who either, A, I have respect for their game for and playing like higher stakes stuff like 2550 heads up on WSOP 5,100, as well as just playing whatever it is I, I want to play and just sort of trying to make the best decisions I can think of and then compare them to how I, how the sim runs them like the, and how pile solver kind of looks at a hand and see how close I was to randomizing like an, a call that might be indifferent, like by percents. And like, that's sort of what drives me now. It's not more of like someone's better than me. I want to be better than them. Cause it's more about like me being better than, than me from like yeah. me in three months wants to be way better than me now. And me now thinks I'm, the best I've ever been kind of idea. I, I, I really admire that about you, that you're the, the test is against yourself. The, the, the race is against yourself. And the fact that you decided at such a young age that it didn't matter what anyone else thought that you were going to do what you were passionate about. It took me a lot longer to figure that out too. I think that's, that's wonderful. I think you've got a clear path. Um, I, I want to talk about these streams that you're doing with Joey and the, the cat jamming, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> well, I'll put the cat up. Yeah. Are you so like you're you're doing commentary and it seems like you're you're kind of exploring different things. I really think that's great, which is I think a part of your vul your vulnerability. Like you're open to trying new things, and so you're doing commentary with Joey. And how did you meet Joey? And like what? How how are you enjoying the commentary in general? So the commentary is great, and I ended up meeting Joey through Twitter. And when I was <laughs> <laughs> and when when I was uh, when I was playing. Uh, micro stakes and doing podcasts and timestamps for Joey. I was doing timestamps when he would have podcasts on, like for new ones. I would do them in real time and like I would mod the chat. And I kind of sent him a DM saying like how hungry I was to get good at poker and that I, I was just going to put everything I had into it. And from there, I didn't just sort of end it. And I sort of kept being vocal about the progress I made and at least in pretty big mile, milestones of like, a hundred thousand hands and having a graph that was like going upwards and then 500,000 hands and then goods, bads, the others. And I would use, like, I would write a blog and I still write a blog, but it's been a long time since I posted just mm -hmm. because I literally remember like when I would write blogs, like I would feel like it was kind of a, like a catharsis sort of activity where I had a, something on my mind that I wanted to talk about after going on like a downswing of sorts and just have something to write about. And then I met Joey through doing timestamps for him. And then we started talking on Twitter and then I sort of put in the volume off, off of Twitter and just grinded a bunch and proved that I meant what I said. And I sort of just got it done. And from there, when I came out to Vegas, he and I met like the second day I was, I got to Vegas and it was like the same thing. Like when we talked through Twitter or like on the phone or on Skype, like, like it was nothing. Like it wasn't like, Oh, like this is like some strange, like some strange guy. Like, it was just kind of like, yeah, like we've been talking forever for the past couple, like year and a half or so. And I'm just, nothing, nothing really changed. And it was really good for both of us to kind of have each other in our lives. 
So how's the commentary going? Are you enjoying that? Is that something you see yourself doing more often? Yeah, the commentary is great. It's just, it's tough when, because Joey just uh, recently kind of got sick a little bit and he was kind of taking this week by himself in the sense of the week before, because this week they're Daniel and Doug are having off. Yeah. But, but yeah, like doing commentary with Joey is a lot of fun. Like I'm talking about something I love to play anyways, like heads up, no limit with one of my best friends. And we're just kind of talking and having fun and making jokes. And it's not, it's nothing serious to either of us. So we just kind of just want to have fun and entertain people that are spending time out of their day to watch us and, and, enjoy listening to stuff I have to say about certain hands and get proven right. Or one of them gets cooler and we start like dancing and playing sound effects. Like, we're <laughs> I love fun. it. Like, we're trying to have fun with it. You know, like we're not looking to, to be like the most like hyper analytical stream there is. And we're not looking to be like the most, like we just have like, honestly, like we have like pretty good memes and like, I'm also pretty good at poker. So it, it works really well to where it's like, we're not just sort of watching and saying, okay, yeah. Like we don't know what's going on, but, that was a big pot. It was like, okay, I know what's going on. And Joey's great at managing the chat and filling in the dead air, like the dead space of no, of no speaking, because I'm really trying to look at the game a little bit and conversate with Joey as well, like with some, with some banter, but I'm also trying to see what's going on in some hands and be able to, when Joey says, Hey Landon, like what's happening here, have a response to that. And it's just yeah. a lot of fun going back and forth. And it's people tell like, tell us all the time, like, the chemistry that we have like in the booth is like insane. And that's just because we're good friends. And it's, it's not because like, that's who we are as individuals, but that's who we are together. Yeah. You're good friends, but you also balance each other out in, you're both not like the exact same type of commentary person. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like you, yeah, you exactly. Like Joey's you're doing different things. Right. Like I'm doing some like analysis in some spots and Joey's kind of doing the color and just having a lot of fun kind of talking about, about memes or about whatever and having sound effects play and it works out really well and I really enjoy doing it for sure. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. I actually adore Joey. So I'm very happy. You are surrounding yourself with everyone I adore, you know. Um, so tell me what's going, uh, what's Landon doing in 2021? What, what do you see happening for you next year? I think I'm just going to play a lot of cash games and I'm also going to play some tournaments. Like nothing's really going to change just going to kind of put in more volume and sort of keep getting better. And then if live poker comes back, play some more live poker stuff, some, some bigger things like the live 10 Ks and stuff like that. And sort of, sort of see where I stand in that environment and just have fun. You know, like I'm just going to have hopefully as much fun as I had this year than as I do next year. Uh, more to me. So is your goal to just have fun or do you have any goals set for like Yeah, I mean certain- most of it's just kind of having fun and just kind of putting more time in poker like I don't really have like a monetary goal of like how much money I'm trying to make next year or how many hours I'm trying to play because I know I put in enough hours and I put in enough volume that I just want to enjoy what I'm doing and that's kind of what's at the forefront of my mind. So uh what would stop you from from playing poker? Like what do you have a stop loss or do you have do you have something that you say to yourself as soon as this isn't fun or as soon as I, as soon as it becomes like this, I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah. Like when I'm playing cash games for sure, like if I play for a few hours and I just feel like I don't want to play anymore and not even as like a tilt induced thing, just as, okay, I played for a couple hours and poker is tiring, you know, like it's hard to stay at, at your peak for many, many hours, but whatever I just sort of feel like, and sometimes that is, through some tilt ways in the sense of not losing big pots, but more just like continually like being very unclear about the strategy I'm trying to take and try like I'm trying to implement. Like sometimes you just get wrecked and you just don't want to play. That's happened to me very, like very, very much in the past couple of months. Like there'd be a couple of days a month where like out of nowhere, like you just instantly stuck infinite and like, you're not sure what happened, but it's okay to take a break. So I just do that. But I don't really have, much that affects me otherwise because I know when I'm playing in games I'm playing in like I'm rolled for it and I'm not taking any shots that like extends out of my reach so yeah Um, what do you do on those days off please don't tell me you play pickleball I play yeah I mean (laughs) you brought it up not me you know 
It's the Vegas pickleball regs. All the right. Vegas pickleball regs. Like, what is it? What the fuck's going on? It's is it that great? It's, it's a great. You got to play. It's a great pickle. I get okay. Every time I go to Vegas, I get invited to like ten different pickleball pickleball games. Pickleball home games. I, I I try to I try to hang out with people. They're like, no, I I have to play pickleball tonight. Do you want to come? I'm like, no, I don't want to come. Why don't we just go for dinner? No, we're playing pickleball. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what yeah. is it? What did Berkey do to the fucking poker community of Las Vegas? I want to know. He started playing pickleball with them, is what he did. <laughs> you love you'll love it. It's a great game. All right. Next time I come to Vegas, I will play pickleball with you, with Joanne. We'll see who else we can round up to play some pickleball. Yeah. Well, I think that was a very dense interview. Okay. Uh, I, is there anything else you wanted to share? No, I'm, I'm chilling, you know. You're, you're okay. big chilling. Big chilling. Uh, so, Landon, last words. I adore you. I admire you. I think the world of you. I will be your friend forever until I'm a drunk old lady at a 1-2 game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Classic Among Us 1-3 reg. <laughs> Shit 1-3 <one>, reg. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, your friendship. I really enjoyed getting to know you this year, and I'm looking forward to more of that. Um, yep. And then next year when, you know, you hit it even bigger, uh, you'll have to do my show again. Okay. Give us a follow-up. Okay. But I'll get the shirt. We'll, we'll, it'll always, I'll always have this shirt on. Okay. Yeah, that's a fair statement. It's, a, yeah. it's just okay. Like I love that it's your profile photo with the hat is. on, with Joey's yeah. hat on. Yeah, it's it's a great yeah, it's a, it's a solid. It's a great avatar. fucking photo. It's, it's solid. solid. That's gonna be like my avatar for at least a couple months for sure. At least. Yeah. 